All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. It is Tuesday morning, uh, and this is the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. And we are addressing two items on our agenda today. We're going to spend the first hour on H783, which is um, there are amendments that have been filed to the bill that we passed back in March, one from the uh, Human Services Committee and then one from our committee from Representative Kalaki that just clarified um, some of the definitions um, in the bill. We had a conversation about these two issues on Friday, but we also received a, um, a document uh, from an individual which has been posted on our on our Facebook page and it was a document that and a person that of interested in who's interested in recovery housing who has actually been in contact with VTAR uh, and so I you know the items on his in his email tended towards um, processes within recovery residences and didn't so much address what we're doing with the bill which um, again I wanted to thank Katie for taking us through the bill last week, um, you know, from a purely, you know, there's several ways to look at the bill. One of which of course is why are we doing this, this bill, um, which is an important part of the conversation, but also a reminder that, that Katie made is that this is basically enabling and for this is an enabling act. This allows recovery residences um, to uh, be certified by um, a certifying organization. In this case, we've, we've named V, are as the certifying organization, um, but they don't have to be, and they can they can adhere to law the law and the underlying law uh, in the statutes of, for all different purposes, um, if they so choose. And you know they would they would only be choosing to join to be certified by VTAR in order to receive the benefit that's offered in this bill, which is to basically say that there will be a statewide allowance in, in zoning to allow um, recovery residences to be in uh, a residential neighborhood, same as group homes, basically using the same language and the same numbers. So uh, with that, I wanted to reintroduce Jeff. Um, and Jeff, I just wanted to be able to, again, it's been a while since we've we've uh, seen the bill. We did get some, we did get some information on it on Friday, but I think from your perspective, if you could just start by, um, Really discussing how you felt the bill has gone, what you felt the changes in the in the uh, suggested changes in the amendments are, but then if you could focus a bit of your time on what uh, what that letter was addressing and how VTAR has worked either with that person or how they intend to utilize not just the information but have the discussion on how is that going to be shaped within how your certification process is developed. And I will, can you unmute yourself easily or shall I try? There you go. One more time. There you go. Great, thank you. Uh, Jeff Moreau, uh, Executive Director for the Vermont Alliance of Recovery Residences. Um, thank you to all of you for your continued work um, on this bill. Um, the amendments that were proposed on Friday, I think all make perfect sense. Um, I'm especially pleased that Representative Kalaki uh, has addressed with all of you preliminary certification um, because that really would have uh, been an issue for new homes um, to get fully certified uh, without having any clients, so to speak. So preliminary certification allows us to uh, certify them based on um, a, a review of the policies and procedures that are in place and a site visit to ensure that the home is, is going to be safe. Um, and then we come back in after that six months um, to provide the full certification and make sure that things are really going well. So in terms of the amendments, um, I think we're headed down the right track. Um, in terms of Mr. Wolf's um, memo to you, um, I'd like to preface that I um, had the opportunity to meet him uh, at the Recovery Coaching Academy uh, where both of us became certified recovery coaches. And I found Kyle to be uh, a very 
knowledgeable and thoughtful person um, in the uh, recovery uh, sphere. And um, just recently, I'd say about a month ago, he and I had coffee uh, and he shared all the good work that he's done and that he uh, proposed to all of you. Um, and I would say that there is so much uh, that he has brought forward that we can learn from um, and that we agree with. Um, the one thing I will say is um, having one prescriptive method uh, for dealing with an individual that has a reoccurrence um, will be detrimental to the system. Uh, we certify homes based on four levels of um, service delivery. And so as we shared with you originally, that's everything from a completely peer run home with no staff to more of a a level four, which is really clinical and has staff and maybe even provides medically assisted treatment. So you can see there's a wide variation in terms of resources that would be available to, to support the individual. So if we just took what Kyle brought forward, um, that wouldn't work in a, all circumstances. But I think what he has brought forward uh, will really help us launch a conversation um, of how we create that safety net that I've talked to you all about of sobering centers. And really the crux of it is utilizing the public inebriate beds um, that are already existing across the state and not reinventing the wheel. And I think that's where Kyle is spot on. We've reached out to uh, ADAP and we have representation on our board uh, from ADAP as well um, to begin the conversation of how can we partner with ADAP and other providers across the state to get access to those public inebriate beds. Right now it's, it's the funding silos and um, we're, we're fairly confident that um, through this partnership, we can break that down. And that will be a resource that these home operators will be able to utilize um, going forward. So um, the last thing I'll say is that um, everyone's path to recovery is, is very different. And we, we really wanna be mindful of that. That is, that's one of the tenets that we believe strongly in. So having one prescriptive approach um, isn't the best practice, um, but having lots of options for people to explore. And, and Kyle's really opened that up for us, you know, it, having time to reflect in the public inebriate bed, having access to go back to residential treatment if that person desires that, having access to medically assisted treatment, having access to counseling and support. Those are all the sorts of things that we want to try to wrap around an individual with um, and let he or she choose um, how they'll move forward from that reoccurrence. And so the amendments, um, one of the conversations that we had about the amendment that was passed by Human Services um, addressed the, the notion, the bill that we passed basically talked about um, the medical side of it and you know, only the prescription side of it and um, it, it, but the the human services definition I think made it more inclusive of the counseling that's what we heard from from representative noise is that is that an accurate way of um, and, a, and, a, and is it more inclusive to you in in order to get the definition right yes I think that's spot on um, and then Representative Kalaki's also, again, you, you mentioned that at the beginning of your testimony about the, um, about the 45 days um, allowing, allowing a, a home to be open for 45 days. I guess, well, we have a couple of questions. I'll go to Representative Triano first and then Representative Walls. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, and thanks for coming in, Jeff. Um, I, I really, um, uh, enthused or, or happy to hear that Kyle's um, message has been heard because it kind of reflected uh, my concerns over the entire course of discussion in this bill. 
um, is that, you know, we all know that relapse is part of recovery. Um, so if we don't deal with that properly, then um, I think the bill would be flawed. But I'm become, I have become more encouraged um, uh, as, as we went on that um, these conversations are taking place, um, that this understanding is, uh, is uh, generally accepted by uh, you folks and uh, most folks that we have spoken with. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Um, what do you what do you think um, the possibilities for um, these um, uh, any public inebriate beds access to those um, as it would suggest in this uh, amendment? Um, do we think you think we're go going to make some headway with that? I really do. Um, we've been talking about this uh, for over a year on the ground, and I'll give you an example. Um, the community of St. Johnsbury uh, received a HRSA grant yep. and I've gone to some of their meetings and the field service director um, in that region had already indicated that they've already done some work in this area um, and to be able to open up access uh, to what is really underutilized. To be perfectly honest with you, I think as part of the process though, we have to do an inventory of where the capacity is. And then we need to figure out how we shore up the capacity where it's lacking. And I, my understanding from the early work that we've done on this is that Chittenden County's public inebriate beds are pretty well utilized and there's not a lot of capacity there. Um, and I think we'll find that in other parts of the state, but generally speaking, um, we do know that there is some access availability. Um, so we want to take advantage of that. And then where there isn't uh, enough access, we want to find other avenues. So one of the things that's very exciting is in St. Albans, there um, has been great work done in collaboration with Samaritan House, otherwise known as Tim's House, to create a second shelter that will be low barrier uh, for folks that are homeless or that um, have substance use disorder. And the facility that they've acquired is right, it's in the same building actually as Vermont Foundation of Recovery's uh, recovery home. So um, in that instance, if someone did have a reoccurrence, they could literally go downstairs um, and take a couple days to think about what their next steps are. Um, so that's one of the ways that we'll address any of the identified gaps. And frankly, it has to be a partnership between ADAP and VTAR and some of the other providers to really get this done across the state. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree. Of course, you know, um, through this um, uh, uh, emergency order, um, we have found that the Department of Corrections has been uh, working on their furlough policy, which is also encouraging that in, in, in respect with, uh, to, uh, you know, um, somebody not being yanked out of a recovery house for relapse and, and thrown back in jail. So that's the other encouraging piece. I think it's coming together uh, pretty well. Um, and I'm uh, optimistic that, um, you know, overall, um, this bill, um, this recovery housing, uh, is in our communities is really what we need, um, and uh, it will uh, it will go a long way to uh, help those in need of recovery. So thanks very much, Jeff, Gus, um, and John. My pleasure. And everyone. <laughs> and before I um, pass the microphone to Tommy, to Representative Walls, Jeff, ADAP stands for. Uh, alcohol drug abuse programs and it falls under the uh, Department of Health. Uh, Kelly Doherty is the deputy commissioner uh, of that program. And and just as a reminder for us, VTAR is? The Vermont Alliance for Recovery Residences and okay. we are the uh, Vermont affiliate of the National Alliance. Okay, you may now go back to using the acronyms. Um, thank you. Um, Representative Walsh. 
Thank you. I have a couple of questions and uh, you just touched on one of them. I was wondering about the, uh, the availability of these public anemia breads, beds. Wow, I, I'll get that to come out right. Public inebriate beds, there we go. And, and thinking that there probably are regional differences in the availability. And, and I, I think you just touched on that, but is that gonna be a real problem in some places, a shortage of these beds? I think there'll be opportunities to fill those gaps, um, but we are gonna find shortages in different pockets of the state. Okay, well, thank you. And then the other question I have is I'm not really clear on the continuum of care. So we have a person in a BTAR type program who has a relapse, goes to a public inebriate bed. Do the services follow? I'm not clear on what the path is there. Sure, that, that's a good question. Um, most of the homes, uh, and again, we certify based on four levels of certification. So it really depends on the type of uh, home that folks are in. Most are certified under what we call level two, which has a part-time house manager. So there aren't a lot of services being provided by the recovery residents to that individual rather they're being provided throughout the community. So if I'm living at a V4 home in St. Albans, I might be going to the Turning Point, which is literally almost across the street. I might be going to the Howard Center for counseling or Northwestern Counseling uh, and Support Services. I would be going to uh, the medically assisted um, treatment clinic so um, those services would still all be available uh, to the individual and the home operator um, would be um, checking in on the individual, making sure that they're accessing uh, those services as, as best they can support that person. Um, but it, it really, it is kind of that village uh, approach uh, helping the individual. It's not always coordinated completely through the recovery residents. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Absolutely. And I, I think one of the key points that's so important in all of this is um, personal choice. You know, um, an individual that has a reoccurrence, um, it may be severe enough that they, they really would benefit from going to residential treatment. On the other hand, it might have been, look, you know, I was in the wrong environment. I allowed myself to be tempted um, and I used and um, I'm ready to get back on track. Um, and then everything in between that. Uh, so um, all those circumstances and then all the individual choices that go along with that play into what the next step is for that individual. Okay, Representative uh, Kalecki. Thank you. And thank you, Jeff. Um, I think the one uh, concern from a lot of people I still am hearing about is um, we've laid out the, the written agreement between the landlord and the resident um, and then there's also the procedures are laid out for temporary removal, but I think there's a concern that people are just going to be tossed out of um, on their own. And so can you address that concern um, from your perspective as a certified agency? Sure. I think that's a, that's an excellent grounding to this conversation that perhaps I, I, I neglected to start with. If you remember, um, what we talked about very early on, and you folks um, did a nice job of crafting the language within the bill to support this. If Representative Kalaki is running a home and I enter that home, he's going to ask what my plan is if I have a reoccurrence. And I would identify that hypothetically I would go to grandma's house. 
you folks added language that you wouldn't just take my word for that, that John would have to uh, call grandma and say, Jeff's identified uh, your home is a safe place for him to go if he has a reoccurrence. Are you okay with that? And that has to be documented. If I'm under uh, uh, supervision of probation and parole, um, you've also put into the bill that you will document um, who my probation and parole officer is. So if I have a reoccurrence, um, the bill now says uh, that um, the operator will bring out that document um, and sit with the individual and say, you've identified that you're going to grandma's house. Let's help you facilitate that. Um, we're going to contact your probation and parole officer uh, so that uh, he or she's made aware so that you're not losing your residency. Um, and that hopefully all works out beautifully. What we've talked about is the opposite end of the spectrum uh, today with the public inebriate beds. Grandma's now upset with me and said to John, no, I'm not having him. He's not coming here. Um, I have no other options. So this notion of a sobering center uh, using the public inebriate beds or uh, a low barrier homeless shelter would allow me to go to that, that space. And that, that's really what Mr. Wolf is um, really encouraging with uh, his language and what, why we're so excited about what he's brought forward. Because it really does give us that safety net that we wanna develop that people are rightfully concerned about. Not everybody is gonna have a safe option uh, to go to. So that, that was the next step in this legislation is once we had this to be able to build a safety net across the state uh, for folks that might fall through the cracks. Okay. Did I thank answer you. that okay? Yes, thank you. I'm good. Representative Byron. Uh, thank you. I, I guess uh, my question is sort of what is there a is there a scenario you mentioned before that there could be in, in theory a potential shortage to the inebriate beds? What is this? What's the backup plan to the backup plan, I guess? Sure. Well, it really is doing an inventory of the low barrier homeless shelters and where there might be access there. So in Burlington, we know that access to the public neighborhood beds is going to be problematic um, from just anecdotally uh, what we're hearing in terms of utilization. But a new place, um, an organization that's a nonprofit in Burlington is doing amazing work. They would be an ideal place for an individual to go. Um, and they are actually expanding their services beyond their um, uh, traditional setting. So that is one avenue uh, that we would be exploring. I think really what we want to have at the end of the day is all the options that are available and feed those into uh, HelpLink, which is the health department and ADAPS um, new 800 number that people can call um, when they need help with uh, recovery services. So really what HelpLink wants to have eventually is almost a, like a bed board that you'd see in a hospital that shows what is the capacity for treatment centers? What is the capacity for recovery residences? What, are, what is the capacity for public inebriate beds? So that if an operator calls and says, you know, I have Jeff uh, with us and um, he needs some help, what's available in the state? They're hoping to really fill that um, eventually. I'd be lying to you if I said, oh, pass this bill and next week we'll be good. <laughs> We've got some work to do, um, but there really is a commitment on VTAR's part as well as ADAP and other providers to, um, to get to that vision that I'm sharing with you. Okay, so basically like expanding capacity is, this, is what you're saying. Right, and there, there is federal funding through the block grant um, 
that comes through that could be used to fill the gaps. I think like Vermonters do, we don't wanna create a whole new program of sobering centers across the state. We wanna utilize what we already have. Um, and uh, that's where the public inebriate beds and the mental health crisis beds and the low barrier shelters really make a lot of sense. And then we just need to fill the gaps uh, with that. And it's just gonna take some time to get a good inventory of that and have it embedded into this new help link uh, process. But everybody's committed to working on that. And I can honestly say to you, so much better than what we've had uh, over the years. We had no certification. We had no you know, oversight of these homes and everybody just did the best they could. And I think we've taken a big step forward. Thank you. Representative Tran. Yes, I just wanted to mention that uh, when we had uh, the Department of Corrections in um, to testify uh, on this bill, um, they were very clear at least that the probation officer would respond quickly um, and that could be a resource for transportation for um, a bed that is available outside. Now, do they work on catchment areas, uh, Jeff, or uh, these public inebriate beds? They work in a catchment area or are they available to someone who is in uh, South Royalton uh, to go to St. Johnsbury and, uh, and uh, get a bed? Is that the way it works? I'm not 100% certain uh, in terms of um, the geography, if they would allow someone to access from another area. I would assume they do, but I don't know the answer to that okay. for sure. Okay. But, I mean, you know, one thing that. that we always hear um, in a lot of the human service elements is transportation. Yeah. And that's, you know, that is a great resource to, for us to be able to tap into. I know a lot of the home operators, they will bring someone to treatment uh, if that person just doesn't have a ride. And I know recently John Caceres from Valley Vista has said, they'll come get the individuals. They've got some new resources to be able to do that. So we're making improvements there as well. Good. Okay, thank you. All right, Representative Hango. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning. I just wanted to ask a quick question about help link because I did publish that and I wanna make sure um, it is available for individuals, but also for um, treatment counselors and other folks who who are in the helping professions. Absolutely, um, they they're um, developing a lot of materials too. So if you need access to that, right on their website, you can request materials to share with professionals. So if there is a conference or. Uh, you have a great relationship with the education system. Educators should have access to uh, that information as well. So it's for the entire state uh, to be able to access. And, you know, uh, like anything that's new, I know that they're, they're learning as they go and they're improving and they're updating information. And that's just how information referral works. I, uh, I was one of the founders of Vermont 211, and we all know that hasn't been perfect. Uh, it continues to evolve, um, but I think it's gonna be really a wonderful resource for people. And one of the things that we often forget about uh, with these types of systems is, sure, it provides information and referral. That's great, that's, that's what it's there for. But one of the side benefits is it also provides all of us with real-time data. So to Representative Byron's uh, question of, well, what about that gap? Well, we'll be able to have real-time data of people that are calling in and not finding a place to access in Morrisville, hypothetically. And then we can take that information to decision makers and uh, funders and say, look, this is the real-time need that we have. It's not just, hearsay and anecdote, it's, it's actually people that fell through the cracks there or didn't have a resource. So 
we need to lean on uh, that system for that information as well. Thank you. So Jeff, two quick questions um, for me. First of all, how long is an average stay? Do you have that um, if someone is released or let's, I mean, it could be released from, from the DOC custody, but um, you know, if I were, if I were at, at a place in my life where I needed to go and I applied to um, a, a recovery residence, what would be the expected time from, from the recovery residence perspective? Like what, what's the time frame? I mean, I know my, my individual recovery would be an important part of that. But again, this is a reminder to me that recovery residence is about, is about living in a place while you're establishing your recovery um, in a way that will eventually allow me to step up. We heard a lot about step up apartments that may be offered through some, but, but this, is, this, is, this is a process that allows me time to um, get more secure in my recovery. And we know recovery can have its issues, as we've discussed. Um, you don't, you, you don't, you're not successful always the first time through. But if I were successful in a recovery residence, what would it look like from a time frame? Sure. Well, you've asked a few questions there, um, so I'll, I'll hit it a couple of different ways. Um, the most operators, and again, this uh, this varies. Um, but most operators ask for a 30 day commitment as the minimum. So um, that people can expect to stay at least uh, for 30 days. Um, I would say, you know, to give you a rough range of average, I think six months is a good solid experience for a lot of folks. And then the longer range would be um, uh, around two years. And what that might look like is um, an individual that came in and lived in the recovery residence for six months to a year, and then moved into a transitional apartment that is affiliated with the recovery residence um, and lived in that, maybe uh, had a roommate or uh, discovered one, and then the two of them uh, go out on their own and get their own apartment. So that's that's kind of the ideal. When you insert the corrections element uh, to this, it tends to be a longer commitment um, as part of uh, their opportunity. Um, at, that will tend to be more of the six months to at least a year uh, that they're in one of those types of programs like Dismiss House or uh, the Restorative Justice Center's program in St. Albans. Okay, and last last question I think for me for today is, um, I, I mean, I would be I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't ask, given given the concentration that we've paid over the last several months about congregate housing, um, what are the issues that you've seen, um, or how are you addressing um, social distancing and so and, and isolation in in the recovery residences that you're aware of? Well, knock on wood, uh, we haven't had any positive cases that I'm aware of, of COVID-19 in any of the recovery residences that we've been working with throughout the state. So uh, we're, we're happy about that. What we've tried to do from VTAR's perspective is just provide a lot of education. Uh, so from the CDC, the health department, of all the precautions uh, for folks to take, um, we, I was actually on the phone this morning trying to get more PPE uh, for our certified homes uh, to be able to have access to. Um, so uh, we've really just focused on education uh, for the homes. I do know that one home, uh, it, they didn't have a positive case, but they were concerned. So they did isolate one individual. Um, and ask that he stay in his room primarily. Um, and uh, they really kind of wrapped around that particular individual to until they were sure that he was okay to protect everybody else. So uh, we haven't had anyone have to be removed or any of those sorts of things related to COVID-19, which is uh, certainly a blessing. 
Um, the other thing that we've done that I'm just really proud of, our board um, at one of our meetings a couple of weeks ago said, um, you know, how can we help the individual? Uh, this is such an uncertain time and we wanna send a message to the individual living in these recovery homes that someone cares about them. And, um, you know, they get a lot of caring and attention from the operator of the home, but someone out in the community. So what we did is for all our certified homes, we bought gift cards uh, to local grocery stores. Um, and uh, it wasn't based on need or anything. It was like, here's a gift card for every single resident in your home um, for them to go out and get groceries. Um, and we got the nicest notes uh, from folks and um, it just made us feel really good to be able to do that as a system. Representative Kalecki. Yes, uh, Jeff, uh, how many homes are you working with that you've certified and how many individuals is that? It's an interesting thing about the, the COVID relationship and I just like to understand the scale. Sure, um, we have eight homes that are currently officially certified um, and then we have another 14 or so that uh, we're working with that want to get certified. Uh, of the eight homes we bought, uh, we bought 50 uh, $20 uh, gift cards. So we invested a thousand dollars. But how many people are living in these eight homes? 50 uh, it's, people? It, uh, it's about 50, yeah. Okay. Thank you. There, there were a couple of empty beds um, at the time. So, um, but we just bought the cards regardless because they'll be coming in eventually. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, any further questions right now for Jeff? Right, what we have in front of us is uh, two amendments. Um, we passed. 783 out of our committee, um, again, prior to crossover or what would have been crossover. Uh, and so we have two amendments in front of us. Uh, we have the human service amendment, and then we have one that was being presented by Representative Kalaki. Um, we would need to vote on those one at a time. Um, and so, uh, and if anybody needs, does, does anybody need a reminder of what those amendments are? The, I mean, the human service amendment was to, um, as we discussed a little bit earlier, our bill basically defined MAT as, uh, as the prescription drug portion of MAT and the human services amendment expanded that simply by taking out some language and said that it's, um, um, actually, John, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually ask you to describe what the two amendments are, um, because you studied them a little bit more deeply than I am, and I don't want to get that wrong. You can unmute. I can't hear you. Uh, there, I'm you sorry. It was it was me, Katie. I wonder if if you're here uh, with us on this call. I am. Okay, so. I think it'd be the four instances of amendment from human services. Could you just remind us of those? Sure. Okay. In the definition, um, so I'm in the first instance of amendment for um, the human services amendment and the amended part of the definition of recovery residents. There's um, a subdivision A and they deleted a clause at the very end of that subdivision A, which read, available to persons recovering from substance disorder. And that was referencing um, assistance, accessing support services and community supports. And that language was um, sort of duplicative with the lead-in language. So that language is gone. Um, the second and third instances of amendment um, make the same change. And that is the version of the bill, um, the report of your committee um, discussed MAT and um, specifically referenced the medication portion of MAT, whereas definition and statute um, kind of takes the medication portion of MAT and counseling together um, as 
kind of one entity, and that is how MAT is defined, those two components. So um, what human services does is reference that definition and take both components of MAT when it's referenced. And then the fourth instance of amendment for human services was just a technical correction. Um, right now, the report that is coming in with regard to furlough um, is going to a number of committees. The underlying bill said the Senate Committee on Economic Development, and this clarifies that the full committee title is um, Senate Committee on Economic Development and Housing and General Affairs. And that's it for the Human Services Amendment. All right, committee, so what's our pleasure? I would entertain a motion on um, accepting, finding the human services amendment as favorable. So moved. Is that, uh, Katie, is there a, uh, a draft number on that? Yes, it's 2.2. 2.2. So I'll move that uh, the uh, Committee on General Housing and Military Affairs um, uh, accept um, the amendment uh, pr as proposed by the Human Services Committee uh, draft uh, 2.1. 2.2. 2. 2. 2.2. Thank you. Second. All right, Representative Wall seconds that. Any further conversation? Um, seeing uh, Representative Zott. I just need a process clarification. I'm all screwed up. Uh, we're voting on these amendments, and is that the end of it, or are we voting on these am amendments and then once again voting on the bill again as amended? Uh, we are simply voting on the amendments. I mean, we voted uh, to support 783 back in March. And so we're finding these amendments favorable to what to the work that we did. But it, it, we won't be revoting on the bill as a whole. No. Okay. All right. Further questions or, or comments? Again, I know they're not here in person, but in absentia, I'd like to thank the Human Services Committee for hearing the bill. Um, I mean, simply having both Katie and David Hall as our attorneys on this bill representing you know, the, the, the split between um, the, the issues that are raised by what a recovery residence is from a medical perspective or from a human service perspective. And then, and then of course, on our end, from a, from a building perspective, landlord tenant perspective um, was a very interesting mix. Um, and I appreciate the work that the attorneys have done it, on this on, on working together, but certainly in the human services on weighing in and, and, and helping us um, craft the definitions in a, in a better way, in a more inclusive way. So thank you to them. Um, seeing no further hands up, the clerk may commence to call the roll if she wants to take us, take her off herself off of mute. Okay. Mary, are you, you're still muted, Mary. There we go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Representative Walls? Yes. Representative Gonzalez? Representative Long? Representative Gamash? Yes. Representative Troiano? Yes. Representative Howard votes yes. Representative Kalaki? Yes. Representative Zott? I certify I'm Representative Zott and I vote yes. Representative Byron? Yes. Representative Hango? Yes. Representative Stevens? Yes. Representative Gonzalez? Representative Long. Okay, Representative Gonzalez is not feeling well today, and so she's not oh, here. Oh, okay. And then so, Representative Long was here, but she had to duck out for another meeting. Okay, so that's 902. 
Okay. Second Amendment is from uh, Representative Kalaki. Katie, can you give us a quick uh, synopsis of what that of what that amendment does? Sure. Uh, the first instance of amendment amends also amends the definition of recovery residence, but in the subdivision B instead of A. Um, the language as it left the committee doesn't reference uh, preliminary certification, and this new language uh, does allow a recovery residence that is obtaining its preliminary certification to be deemed a recovery residence under the definition. So that's the first instance of amendment. And second, um, there's uh, an update in language that would allow a resident who has been um, temporarily denied access to either have their property returned uh, to him or her or to ensure it's safekeeping at the recovery residence. And that's it. All right, any questions on this? Seeing none, um, I, um, oh, wait a minute, Representative Gamash. I just have a quick question. Um, sure. Regarding the retaining the property and ensuring safekeeping, is there a time limit on that? I'm, I'm just wondering if someone doesn't return for whatever reason or, um, and does not uh, make an arrangement to pick up personal belongings or such, how would that, how would that be handled? Um, I, I think- I, 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 I totally understand keeping personal things. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And then I guess, you know, there's the assumption that the person will, would return unless there's some. Well, this uh, is for, this is for temporary, this would be for those days, you know, with the, with the temporary removal, um, which is your first. Right, but temporary could turn into permanent. So I will ask um, Jeff if you can if you can unmute and just give us uh, an answer to how this might work. How what happens when an individual is put into a temporary removal and then might transition for, for either personal choices or for or for uh, another uh, breaking of the rules uh, issue? If you could address that for Representative Gamash, I'd appreciate it. Certainly. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. Great. Most often uh, the home uh, has language and if this passes in the bill, we'll ensure that they do um, in the um, membership agreement, uh, how long they will hold the personal belongings if the person leaves. And usually it's 30 days. Um, I think the nice thing about this amendment is it really gives strong clarity that if the person leaves that the operator not just throw the uh, belongings out on the corner um, right. and it does give them access to it. Uh, but I think uh, Representative Gamash's inquiry is, is really an excellent one that can be handled through the um, participant agreement. And most of the, the homes that we've certified do have that language in there. Okay, thank you. All right, further questions? Seeing none, um, I would entertain a motion to accept or to, to accept um, Representative Kalaki's amendment as friendly. I move to accept the amendment as friendly. Okay, and that, hey, Katie, what version is that? Is that, is that a 1.1? 1. 1? Senator Kalak, uh, I've made two, you a senator. 2.1. <laughs> 2.1, 2. 1, sorry. 2.1. <laughs> All right, so Representative Gamash has moved that we accept Representative Kalaki's um, version of the amendment 2.1. Um, I'll second it. And Representative Trano, uh, further discussion, Representative Trano? Please, um, I just wanted to, uh, it's just a comment that this was a concern that I think we addressed properly. Um, I 
think it was uh, Stephen Whitaker that uh, brought it up uh, that oftentimes, um, I know in my dealings with folks um, in corrections and people that are taken to jail suddenly um, lose their belongings. Um, and to restart that is really difficult. So I think that this is a really important piece of this bill that um, individuals who are participating in these programs uh, are not concerned uh, about losing their belongings um, if they are removed from the house. I think that's a, a, a wise idea and I think it's uh, a, a credit to um, the recovery house, um, uh, recovery houses and the recovery house bill. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, seeing no f further discussion or hands raised, um, Representative Howard, you may commence to call the roll. Representative Walls. Yes. Representative Gonzalez is out. Representative Long is out. Representative Gamash. Yes. Representative Triano. Yes. Representative Howard votes yes. Representative Kalaki. Yes. Representative Zott. I certify I'm Representative Zott and I vote yes. Representative Byron. Yes. Representative Hango. Yes. Representative Stevens. Yes. 902. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, so these amendments, Ron, um, will be brought down to the clerk's office or sent to the clerk's office. You will then also certify, uh, with, you send a sheet mm -hmm. to Mary, Representative Howard. Yes. Um, and Katie, do, I, do I send the uh, amendments down or do you to the clerk's office? Um, I, I suppose I thought at the committee amendment would come from the chair of human services and that um, Representative Clackey would have to um, send his. So Representative Pugh would send hers even though this committee voted on it? Um, yes, because you were just voting that you what the committee, if the committee finds it favorable, it's not the work of the committee. Okay, so how does the vote get transferred? I know how it happens normally, but how does the vote get transferred to the clerk's office? That I'm not sure. All right, I we'll think, send I Bill the information and he'll catch yeah. up to it all. Okay. I think Representative Pugh did already send to the clerk's office their amendment. And then it came back to us. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. So, okay. so we'll get this. Yeah, we'll get this straightened out. I mean, the, the, I think the most important, the first important piece will be for Ron to um, send the vote sheets to Mary so she can certify them. Um, we'll make sure that representative, if it's if it's representative Kalaki's responsibility, uh, which I think it is, because I mean this um, this is just imagine any other normal day if you needed to get. Um, an amendment done for something, you would go see the attorney and you would work with the attorney and it would be under your name. And I think that's what we did here as, as Representative Kalaki's um, amendment. So that um, we'll make sure uh, Representative Kalaki can check to the, the clerk's office to find out um, that it's been filed properly. Um, I, it's unlikely that we'll see this bill on this week on the floor. Um, so that gives us some time to figure it out um, because with the earliest we'll get it to the clerk's offices sometime this afternoon and then it'll be on notice for tomorrow at the very, you know, so the very earliest we can deal with it on Friday is Friday, but I think we're, I think the way they're stacking up the bills um, and we're only on the floor for a short amount of time on Friday or scheduled to be on the floor for a short amount of time on Friday. So I'm not sure that this would appear, but again, we will get that cleared up by the end of the day um, today and find out when that, when that's going on. I think this is a bill that definitely needs the um, this is a bill that definitely needs some caucus time, some explanations in the whole all house caucus to, to, to give everybody the opportunity to hear it before it goes on the floor. Um, I think we saw an example last week of where 
the tree warden bill in particular had not been given a, a hearing in a caucus. And so people were just naturally curious about it, uh, which extended the testimony on it probably longer than, than may have happened if we had had a, 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 an all house caucus on it prior to the floor. And certainly the recovery residence bill is um, complex enough that it's gonna need some, uh, some education to the whole caucus before we get on the floor. But we'll keep it. We'll keep track of that. So thank you, Jeff, um, for coming in. Thank you very much, everyone. Who's on? Who's who's listening to web radio? Oh no, it's my cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to mute you then. Um, so um, thank you, Katie. Yes, thank you, Katie. Um, So we are now, so Katie, I think you, you may go have lunch. Thank you for your help today. Um, so we have, um, for the second hour today, we're going to go back to the housing um, situation. We have Gus Selig back with us this morning, um, this afternoon now. And I just wanted to continue this conversation. This is, this is, um, you know, the, it, this remains an important part of, of our work of understanding what we can do, um, what we're able to do and how we're gonna be able to do it. It is so complicated with, with respect to the CARES Act money. And um, I know that Gus, uh, as a representative from VHCB uh, has been conversation and testimony in other committees specifically over in the Senate, you know, human services here in the house with various facets of the conversation that we're, that we've been having as well. And I just wanted to come in and first get a, um, get an update, not only of those conversations, Gus, but also of course, of what you've learned over the last few days about what we can do with the CARES Act money, what's, what's been clarified, perhaps what remains murky. Um, and then, and then, um, you know, again, the news we heard from AHS sort of was, uh, their their um, input is going to be probably more geared towards the short term solutions. What's the next step from from when we need to move people out of motels, um, if if and when we need to move people out of motels, which I think is clear to everybody that that's the next step. Um, but also, what are the medium and long term solutions that you've been hearing about? I think because I think we're going to need to take a real, probably a little bit more energized stance on on you know, just investigating at the very least, what are the options in front of us? Um, so the microphone is yours. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. So for the record, I'm Gus Selig. I'm the director for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Um, and just, I know I've been before you bef in the past, um, but just to separate us, us out a little bit from the alphabet soup of housing organizations that you deal with, the board is the one entity in, uh, through which state funds are generally appropriated for the capital side of developing and rehabilitating housing. Um, most recently, we, um, with your support, um, endeavored uh, with a, to develop a housing revenue bond that uh, is now fully, turned out to be $37 million, uh, now fully committed and will produce 843 um, homes or apartments all over the state. Over time, we've been involved in 13,000 homes in most communities in the state. Um, you know us usually best by investment in cornerstone buildings like the old Waterbury Seminary in the Chairs District, downtown buildings in Hardwick, uh, so on and so forth. We've worked uh, in South Burlington and other communities on new neighborhoods where that's been the need. Um, over the years, we've worked with most of the homeless shelter providers in the state, um, some so long ago that they don't know that we provided capital grants to them. We also provide support through our AmeriCorps program. There are usually five to seven AmeriCorps members that are assigned each year to those organizations that serve the homeless. Um, as a matter of background, um, five or six years ago, an executive order was issued that asks that anybody who's getting public support um, set aside 15% of their homes for either homeless Vermonters or people who are at great risk of homelessness. 
Um, I'm pleased to tell you that that, um, uh, that challenge has been met and exceeded about 17% of the provider of the housing that we have supported, rental housing that we've supported is now occupied by people who were in that situation across the state. Uh, and that's close to a thousand units of, of, uh, of the rental housing that we've supported. Um, I was in the Human Services Committee, as the chair indicated last week, um, and testifying along with me was Jeffrey Pippinger from the Agency of Human Services. And what he told them at that moment was that uh, that week, 2,000 Vermonters were in motels um, as a result of the loosening of rules and support through the GA program and the, the absolutely dire need to get people out of shelters that would have been unsafe because people just could not in a COVID environment be sleeping that close together. There weren't separate bathrooms necessarily for folks and so on and so forth. And AHS has just done a tremendous job, I think, responding to that immediate crisis. But 2000 Vermonters I, is, is an awful lot. Uh, what Mr. Pippinger said at that um, time uh, that really struck me was that this was in essence an inflection moment for the state and a time to reimagine how we might deliver emergency housing services to people and how we could do better. And that certainly is the work that I've been about and working on for quite a while and more intensively with our partners in recent weeks. Uh, my colleague at the board, Jen Holler, worked with across agencies uh, with our friends at AHS and at the HFA and the State Housing Authority on a project that we've reported to you on a few years ago called a Roadmap to End Homelessness. We brought a national consultant in. And in recent weeks, that's really been a kind of cornerstone document of people as people have talked about what are the medium and long-term solutions to the problem of homelessness. I think about three years ago, this committee heard from Dr. Megan Sandel of the Children's Health Watch in Boston. And uh, her testimony struck me at two levels. The first was that she argued very strenuously and with data to you that housing is a social determinant of health and that health costs um, and mental health costs go up dramatically uh, when people don't have housing. Um, I think that's been borne out in any number of ways. Um, we understand the struggles kids have uh, being educated when they don't have secure housing. Um, if you think about being a diabetic and not having a place to refrigerate your medication, um, your health can't be as good as it would be. The other key thing that she said, and she showed you a chart, um, was she looked at what we spent in the United States on health care and what we spent on other supports and safety net programs, including housing, and then compared that with lots of other Western countries in the world. And not surprisingly, we spend a huge amount, much more on healthcare and much less on support services and, and, and housing um, uh, to support vulnerable people. And I think her, the fundamentals of her argument is that there are cost savings to be had if we invest more in housing and services. Um, the fundamentals of the roadmap and any roadmap on this issue is we have some parts of the state where we have an inadequate supply of housing. And you can give somebody a voucher and they may not be able to find a landlord who would accept it. And if we don't expand supply, and this was a big part of our work with the housing revenue bond, um, you will not house those folks successfully. There are a whole host of Vermonters who, um, and especially in, in light of unemployment that we're now faced with, uh, simply need subsidy to get by. And then there are other Vermonters who really need services, some of a lighter nature and some of a clinical nature. Um, so not everybody needs all three of those things, but we need all three of those elements in a plan uh, to be effective over the long term. Um, and I can tell you that we've been talking and you saw a proposal from CHT and Housing Vermont a few weeks ago. Um, we've been talking with the providers we work with on a regular basis about the elements of such a plan. And I've been in close touch uh, with Maura Collins, my colleague at VHFA and Richard Williams, 
at the Vermont State Housing Authority about a comprehensive, what a comprehensive plan might look like. I think Richard testified last week or the week before, I'm not sure in which committee, that if we wanted to produce, provide vouchers for a thousand Vermonters, it would cost $12 million annually. Um, uh, services are not my area of expertise. Again, my colleague, Mark Collins, who also chairs the, is at VHFA and chairs the Pathway Board, uh, is more expert than I am. But we've had a lot of input from the Agency of Human Services. And depending on the clinical needs of whether somebody needs clinician's help or needs other kinds of wraparound services, we can ballpark costs based on 15 to caseloads of between 15 and 30 folks. Um, we clearly also need some an infusion of some dollars if some of these facilities around the state that have provided shelter are going to be reoccupied to improve them. You've heard from Pathways Vermont that they could house another 200 Vermonters in existing housing. So I think the elements are are in front of us and we'd be happy to work with you in giving you um, a comprehensive long-term plan. In recent days, we've heard from a number of your colleagues, including appropriators, um, about what can we do urgently with the coronavirus, the coronavirus relief fund. Um, we have looked at data that the Agency of Human Services has given us about where we have the largest numbers of homeless Vermonters in various in their regions across the state, where there are the most families with kids who are homeless. We have been in close contact both with nonprofit housing developers and with and they with their service providers about what the opportunities are in the short term to make a dent in this. And the short term meaning that as we understand the guidance from the Coronavirus Relief Fund, funding needs to be spent by December 30th and spent means more than we write a check. It means that the work is done. We think we've identified five to nine opportunities all over the state of various types, again, in these high area, high need regions that could likely produce 200 new units of, again, of various types. Some might be micro apartments. Um, some are apartments that need rehab and can be rehabbed relatively quickly. The catch to this is we can do this work, uh, make some deals happen by the end of the year, if we can also establish a rental assistance reserve and a services reserve. It is not unusual when we close the housing deal um, that a part of their budget is a capital needs reserve, an operating reserve. It is unclear whether or not a reserve for rental assistance, and this is allowed under other, other federal programs uh, like the National Housing Trust Fund, could be established um, as part of a as part of a, the closing of a real estate deal. Um, so that's what we're up against. The thing that I would say to you today is that if we are to try to tackle that, uh, to add 200 units to our supply in those regions that where we need the housing the most and might continue to be a pivot point uh, in the future as those folks get integrated into other settings and be much safer than the current shelter system. We urgently need a signal that you want us to do that. Um, it takes time to, to negotiate real estate deals. It takes more time in a remote environment to get those deals closed. Uh, the projects we're looking at would all need, many of them would need at least light rehab not the kind of substantial rehab you usually see us undertake. Um, and the clock is ticking. So the quicker you can get policymakers, yourselves, the appropriators, and others to say, yeah, we'd like to have some long-term impact with the coronavirus relief fund, uh, the quicker we, we can get to work and secure some of these potential facilities around the state. So I'm happy to answer questions um, I'm happy to go to work with Maura and Richard and others in developing a more comprehensive plan that will have a much higher price tag and take a lot of mapping of where can the resources come from. As I said, the, the rental assistance for a thousand folks, Richard tells us is, you know, 
each person cost about $8,000 a year. Uh, so it's a $12 million to provide rental assistance for a thousand Vermonters. We do expect that the administration will come forward with a short-term rental assistance program and a rent arrearage program. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about that. That's very important. They'll probably come forward also with some form of a mod. They've been discussing a, a, a modest rehab program as well. Um, clearly, we need to do whatever we can to make sure that as people have lost income, lost jobs, that they don't fall into homelessness and make the problem we have today worse. Um, but I would say to you that um, it makes both fiscal sense from my perspective because of the savings we'll ultimately accrue in our healthcare system, our correction system, our mental health system to invest in some, some of these funds in some permanent solutions. So I, I'll stop there and, and answer your questions. That's just quickly, the 200 units that you're talking about for this, for this immediate situation would house approximately, or did you guesstimate on how many people this would, this would affect or is it all dependent on whether it's a single family, a single person household versus a family? Um, well, I know that, you know, for instance, we have identified some apartments in Bennington that can quickly be renovated and another facility that is waiting for grants that wouldn't necessarily be announced until the end of the year that would all be for families. So for those 30 households, it would be at least 60 people. And I think in the rest of the state, you know, there would be some families housed. We opened a facility called Great River Terrace, which mostly has single adults in Brattleboro in it, uh, but there are at least uh, three parents with a child living in those micro apartments. So it would, it would be more than 200. I just can't tell you today whether it would be 300 or 250 or, or exactly what the number would be. Um, I think we, it's clearly in everybody's interest to focus as much as possible on getting kids and their families out of a situation of homelessness because the long-term costs and implications are um, the trauma that that induces in a family is just uh, can be, the, the data says it's very hard to overcome. So that would clearly be a big focus of ours. But I think we also want to work on um, individuals who have significant needs that you've all heard end up in the emergency rooms in our state hospital. And, you know, I, I understand the hospitals are significantly, those ERs are much quieter day. And I think part of the reason is people are currently being housed. Um, so I do think there are savings to be achieved. All right, we have a handful of questions here. Um, I'll start with Representative Triano and then Representative Hengo. Thanks, Gus, for coming in. It's always good to see you. A um, couple of questions. One is, um, I guess, uh, Pathways, uh, we were told by uh, that Pathways, um, 200 beds would cost about $3 million. Is that your recollection as well? Um, I didn't hear the testimony, but that's how it was reported to me. Okay. And okay. I believe and that's, other... an that's an ongoing cost. Um, you know, so what I've been focused on, I'm, with the coronavirus relief fund is what can we do and incur those costs by December 30th? Right, okay. Um, the other piece is that we had spoken some about uh, overlapping services um, that we have heard from uh, plans from uh, three or four different um, agencies and uh, organizations. And um, it did appear to be some overlap the services have you has that been looked into a little bit more Gus as to well, who would be responsible for what what I can tell you um, is that the way we are working and I, I I preface this by saying I'm not the services expert uh, by any means I long ago I worked in community action but it but that was 30 years ago um, what we have done, for instance, with our Brattleboro example, and we have another project in development in Rutland at, at a former school uh, that's been vacant for some time, is we get the housing providers and other partners together. Sometimes it's the, in, in the case of Great River Terrace, it's a partnership between the mental health agency 
and um, ground, the Groundworks Collaborative. So the housing entity does the capital end of it, manages the property, but there are they have contracts with the service providers to actually provide services uh, to the residents. And I think in every community, it ends up being a, what the mix of services is, is a little different. And in some cases, you're working with groups that are focused on battered women. Um, so there isn't like, one singular model, but we certainly don't want overlap and we want coordination. All right, Representative Hengo. Thank you. I have a few questions. Um, I just want to reiterate that you said that you've identified 200 units statewide that need some kind of light rehab that could be ready by the end of December. Did I miss a dollar figure that went along with that or no? Um, you didn't miss it because I didn't put it in front of you. Uh, so it's a great question to ask. We think that the acquisition and rehab is in the $21, $22 million range. Um, we think the, the rental assistance is another seven to eight million. The services is another two to $3 million. If we can capitalize those up front or if we can identify ways that though they can be met through existing services. Okay, thank you. And that leads me to um, the rental assistance and the support services um, you did not believe could be covered by the Corona Relief Fund, correct? What I said is that from my perspective, it's a gray area, which yeah. is to say the argument I would make to you and to anybody is it is not unusual when we do any kind of housing deal um you know and we, we've just done a couple in franklin county um up in st albans that when we when the project closes there are reserve funds that are part of the project sometimes it's a reserve to make future capital improvements sometimes it's a reserve to cover an operating loss so I would say to you, it is not unusual in, in the affordable housing world to capitalize a reserve. And what we don't know is whether um, the feds will accept the capitalization of such reserves up front as a legitimate cost for the coronavirus relief fund. So I'm not, uh, if you read it as conservatively as some people might, you'd say that's off the, off the tracks. What I can tell you is two weeks ago, the guidance that Mr. Steve Klein, your joint fiscal officer got was, you can't invest this in capital. And then last Thursday, I got an email from him late in the evening that said, capital for to serve the homeless is now on the list. Um, so I think that it is possible we could get to yes on this, but it will take um, your support and probably input from our congressional delegation to get the kind of clarity that I know everybody would be more comfortable with. So thank you for that. Um, so by capital, you mean that 21 to $22 million um, that's identified. You don't mean to say the additional 10 million for rental assistance and support services being built in into a reserve and counting on the coronavirus relief fund to fund that as well? What I'm saying is that we, it, it appears quite clear that the money for acquisition and any rehab that can be done by December 30th clearly qualifies. Mm -hmm. The capitalization of reserves for services and rental assistance is a gray area okay. in my mind. Okay, that's what I thought. I just wanted to clarify that. So I also have a question on um, how did you identify these 200 units that are vacant and ready to be rehabbed? Um, well, in it's a variety of different ways. And I, I actually, my staff has been work, working on this, so I can't tell you each one. In some cases, people are talking to brokers in uh, one case, there's a 100-unit development in Bennington known as Applegate Apartments, and I happen to know there are 20 vacancies there and talk to the owner about what it would take to get them ready for use. There's another facility in Bennington that um, we helped an entity buy, and it's um, they're hoping to get a grant from the Federal Home Loan Bank, but that won't be announced until the end of the year if we 
could use the coronavirus relief fund to get that work underway now. It could be operable. So there's a variety of different kinds of properties that people are looking at all over the state. And that's being done by our community partners, not by us. I'm not, my staff's not out looking for these properties. It's really local people on the ground, your constituents who serve these populations on a regular basis, trying to assess what, you know, real estate is always opportunity. What are the opportunities right now? What's, what's for sale on the market? And they've been having those discussions at the community level. Okay, so it's properties for sale. It's not necessarily vacant rental properties that are not up for sale. Um, in the case of Applegate Apartments, it is uh, that's an existing property that 80, 80 families are in right now and there are 20 vacancies. So as I said, it's a mix okay. around the state. But in some cases, yes, it is properties that are for sale. And by around the state, do you truly mean all corners of the state or just um, focused in the larger municipalities like St. Albans, Burlington, Brattleboro, Bennington, St. Johnsbury? Um, we have been focused based on the data that AHS gave us on Northwestern Vermont, the Upper Valley, Brattleboro, and Bennington. Uh, they would follow that by saying, uh, we'd love facility, more facilities in central Vermont and Rutland. We, if we give a signal to people that the legislature and the governor want to spend some money on this, we may well get some proposals from other parts of the state as well, um, but we don't have them today. Okay, and my last question has to do with location. So what, what do you do if you have um, a a congregation of vacant properties or available units, let's call them, in municipalities, but your homeless people live in rural areas. How, how do you reconcile that? Well, I don't easily reconcile that. And I, you know, there is gonna be more than one solution to this, pro to this problem and certainly that's why a rental assistance program and the approach that a group like Pathways takes is so important. Um, what I can tell you is the reason that I've named those parts of the state is because when we sat with our partners at the Agency of Human Services, they gave us the data on where, is, where are the greatest needs in the state. Um, so, um, you know, and I do think people will do better in the long term and this isn't everybody will be an exception to every rule if they can be someplace where there is public transit if they can be someplace where there are services and social services that they can get to either by public transit or on foot um, as opposed to being far out in the countryside um, so we're following the data to focus on where where can we where should we go first second third and fourth is what I can tell you today. But I, I would, I think it's very important to view that people are being economically displaced all over the state and we will need different approaches in different communities to meet the need um, as well. Thank you. All right, Representative Walls. Thank you and thanks, Gus, thanks for coming today. Uh, you know, this rehabbing issue is one that's dear to me, one I've been pushing for a while, and I'm happy to hear there's a possibility through the Corona Relief Fund for an infusion of cash that might have this, make this happen. Uh, but I, I, I do have a question about the role of the Vermont legislature. I'm not really clear about that. Uh, these are federal funds and it seems like the administration would be figuring it out how to deal with them and disperse them. Uh, so what is it that, what do we do as a Vermont legislature? What's our part in this? Well, um, I believe that what your appropriations committee has done up to now was to say to the administration, go ahead and spend some of that federal money on some things and then bring us back a plan uh, for the balance of it that will be Come part of the Appropriations Act. So I think that 
there will be an opportunity for the legislature to weigh into what the plan is and how those federal funds can best serve the needs of Vermont. And, you know, and I'll be clear, I know that housing is not the only need. Um, there are needs in the healthcare world and, you know, we, there are needs and I'm sure the administration will be coming out with this soon to assist small businesses. This is the part of the need that my, that in my work needs to be addressed most. And that's why I'm speaking to it today. So I, I'm sure you'll see that the administration will be bringing lots of plans out for the use of these funds. And there will be competing demands and you folks as the General Assembly, I have to sort out what you think is most important to utilize these funds for. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mary Howard, Representative Howard. Hold on, you're still on mute. There yeah, you go. Sorry. Thank you. And thank you, Gus, for your testimony today. You mentioned the renovation of the school in Rutland. Do you know if that is ongoing or if there has been a halt to that? Um, my understanding is that that project now has all the funding that it needs. It got an allocation of low income housing tech. We supported it quite a while ago through the housing revenue bond. In uh, about a month or so ago, our partners at VHFA gave it an award of low-income housing tax credits, and that should be under construction, I would think, this fall. I don't think it'll be open by December, but it, it should be um, underway uh, and okay. into renovation this fall. Okay, great. Thank you. And that, that'll provide 19 micro apartments, I believe, is the number there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Got some micro apartment. Is that a studio with a small bedroom and a kitchenette? Um, well, it's it's a term of art, but it probably means 350 square feet or less. So whether there's a separate bedroom or it's just a studio with a, a bathroom and a kitchenette, um, it's probably not quite a one bedroom. But 350 square feet is the is the approximation square feet yeah. in that range yeah um in terms of going back to the question about capitalization i think that there's a a, a nuance here i think that you're that you're talking about like what is a gray area in terms of that because under a con if i'm not mistaken under a conventional project you would include the the um capital improvements or you would include any other of the issues, um, the, 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 perhaps the service issues within the project itself, is, is, is that right? And that's why you would consider it a, a capital expense, even if the federal government does not quite get that yet. As I said earlier, uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, we, when we close a real estate deal, there are various kinds of reserve funds so that the project can perform as it's intended to over time. And sometimes that's for capital needs. Sometimes it's to deal with operating losses or rent losses. There have been a few times, and I think we've been encouraged to do this with the National Housing Trust Fund, where you can set some money aside for services over a number of years. Um, so it's not an unprecedented thing to suggest, um, but, it, but, but I, as I said, it, we don't have clarity and yet on whether that will be allowed or whether we can look for other resources. So for instance, the uh, Speaker Pelosi passed a bill in the House last week that will provide a huge amount more money for the ESG program. Maybe that can be a source of rental assistance. Um, I talked with somebody at AHS last week and they don't know for sure, but um, FEMA has provided in past emergencies monies for case management. So that might be another source for case management. Um, but yes, to get back to the, to, the, to the question you asked, we typically capitalize reserves and projects as part of getting them funded. That's not an unusual activity. And there are federal housing programs that have been used for those purposes in the past. 
one of the concerns that, that, that I have and I've heard, and I think we've all heard is that, okay, so if we spend 20 some odd million dollars in a short term or, or even 70, whatever the number is on finding projects and finding properties and, uh, and doing it, your partners can't necessarily just do these without those services. I mean, is isn't that kind of the precept of 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 affordable housing? Is that is that all of these pieces that make housing a vaccine, as you were alluding to earlier? But there's a like we can't just build a house and then expect to the services to follow. Those have I mean, and again, that's part of I think one of the concerns that I've heard from you know in the appropriations world is that okay so we have these things now you're telling us that we have to bake in these these services and i think that gets at this gray area that you're talking about but i'm just what is it that would stop or what have, i guess i'll put it in a positive sense what is the combination that you need from from us to commit from the state to commit in order to make these projects happen well i you know because i think we all expect the state is going to have several difficult budget years. Our planning has been around a reserve that would, you know, take us out three to five years um, in terms of moving forward. Um, so that's the thinking we've been doing about it. It has been to establish a reserve that would carry us for a number of years um, to, to meet those needs. And again, not everybody will have the need for clinical services. Some people will need a lighter touch. They may need help finding a job. They may need other kinds of assistance, but there are certainly people among the homeless population that need an intense level of services. And whether that comes from the designated agencies or other providers um, in order to successfully house people, um, that's, that's an essential piece of the package. So this is just a way of of saying, okay, so for these particular, because th these particular services will be available for three to five years to coincide, to, to coordinate with the housing. I mean, I think one of the things with um, the pathways number, which I actually think is probably closer to three and a half million dollars, is that that would be the, in that would include an increase to go statewide, which is a desired outcome of sorts. I mean, th they came in this year asking for two, two extra counties, which would have been nine, I think their ask was $900,000. But this this larger number would then become the number that's in the budget for pathways down the line. And that's, that's what scares some people. And I think that's, that's what it, I mean, it scares me only because it scares other people. I mean, it, it, these services cost money, this is what it would cost. We've seen pathways present um, statistics that show that that three and a half million dollars might be the equivalent of some other larger number as you alluded to when you're paying retail for services um so it's just it's just an interesting but it's it if we can get this it sounds like if we can get this defined this gray area defined of what the capital expenses are that that might um open some other doors and allow these projects to move forward that's that that's what we think we can do yes okay um so committee um i don't know what our i mean i i think i i'm trying to look for next steps for us i mean what more information do we need to hear in order to start in order to start you know I, I think having these discussions is important because this is this is a public conversation, and I think we're we're trying to define what priorities are. And um, but I'm wondering and asking for opinions on next steps here. I mean, we can continue to develop. Um, we can continue to hear what the possibilities are. We will. We can continue to try to imagine what the next steps are going to be for again the medium and long term. Um, but then, you know, the reality is, is that the skinny budget is going to start being discussed pretty darn soon. And so, so is this, is this proposal or is this idea that these ideas that are going to may formulate into a proposal, is this something that we, you know, what do we need to hear? What do we need to advocate for, for, um, 
work with appropriations to make sure they get the message because there is a lot of competition for the funding. I think we're going to hear from um, I think we're going to hear from the administration sometime this week about their plans on uh, some of the economic money to be spent uh, on businesses that have that have been hit. Um, as we've heard, you know, this is it, there's a long line of of people who are who are um, hoping for help. And so, you know, how we advocate for this or how we discuss this is really um, the next step. So I would, while we still have Gus here, if there's any further questions or further comments on, on what we should do and who we should be talking to and how we should be talking to them, um, the floor is open and I see Representative Kalaki and then Walls. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Steven. I, 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 I'm wondering, we heard from Josh and Sarah that there was gonna be this rehousing plan that was being formulated and it seemed to be so aligned with Gus with many of the things you're talking about. I don't know what happened to that. Is, is Sarah Phillips not developing this plan and should we not hear from her? Uh, because the conversations we heard, there seemed to be a real congruence happening. That seemed really terrific, but uh, so that's how I don't know how to judge moving forward. And, and I mean, this this committee, you know, homelessness is one of our uh, things. It's 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 ours, and so um, this I think is important to us to get it right. Uh, but I don't want to start piecemealing um, things and not understanding a bigger picture. And so, Gus, am I wrong that there's is there still going to be a rehousing plan from the I, I, th I think that I think and I can't speak for Sarah that right. the plan will be far more modest than she might have hoped and I do think you'll hear from Josh and they are very rightfully focused on rental assistance and rent arrearage assistance um, as a positive use uh, I can't guarantee that but I know that they're pushing for that but I think the kind of comprehensive plan that we were, I think we are very much in alignment at a staff level about how to take that roadmap to end homelessness that, that you got a few years ago and actualize it. Right. I guess I would say two things today. One is that it would be wise to have a small group of people begin to plot out now that we have 2000 Vermonters in motels what a long-term plan is going to look like. Uh, that might not be for you to act on this year, but and figure out how to where the resources can come from to get it funded. I think what I'm telling you, we've suggested to the appropriators today for the coronavirus relief fund is a piece of that plan. It's not it's not the full plan. It doesn't do everything. It's you know it's going to serve some of the people who have been uh, who were made vulnerable, but not do it all. And, and I guess what I would also say is the longer we wait to get started on it, the harder it will be to achieve even the 200 units by year's end. Right. And we, we struggle each year. Uh, well, in the two years I've seen the struggle that I've been here in trying to build affordable housing and with, with the bond that we had. And I know there was concerns, do we do another bond? And that doesn't seem to be fiscally prudent to do. But there seems to be an opportunity, as I understand it, with COVID relief money to do a capital investment that can take a piece of this, this dilemma that we we're grappling with. It, so that's, that's what I'm hearing from you. Is that correct, Gus? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And, and I think um, to the larger issue, you know, just to say, simply say, okay, we need to house 2000 people. That's that's what we're working with, but the I, I think we need to also keep in mind what Ken Schatz provided us, which was the percentage breakdown, um, where you have X number of people who are episodically homeless, who may it may have just happened because of an eviction or because of they lost because of general poverty, they lost their jobs, and they didn't have a place to go. As a and then there may be a certain number at at the other end of the homelessness spectrum of people who are chronically homeless, who are who are some of the most difficult people, whether it's due to mental health issues or extreme poverty or lack of availability in their, you know, but there is, and, and, and Gus mentioned earlier, there's a set, there's a number of folks who have um, 
households with kids. And, you know, again, I'm not, I don't want to prioritize one or the other, but if we start breaking down who's homeless and where they are, I think, I mean, that may help us shape at least some of this conversation, but understand, you know, it's like under, I mean, the, the, the benefit of having the data that we have is at least we, we're beginning to know who's homeless as of now and where they are and that, and hopefully we can use that information. Um, Representative Walls and then Triano. Thank you. Uh, actually, I was thinking along very much the same lines as Representative Kalaki was uh, trying to make some sense out of this because there are so many moving parts and it's not clear what resources are gonna be available for what and what is allowed. So I, we really need to figure out uh, which pieces of it we can deal with. And I think uh, Representative Stevens, you just, you know, you just good, did a good piece on what we should know about the homeless situation. I think we need to do more of that. And we need to know, we need to have a better idea of, is there really something available that we can uh, recommend to take care of this? Or is the Corona Relief Fund really available to help take care of that? And, and there, there, just, there are so many questions. So I guess one of the things I would like to have is some kind of master plan, which I don't know exists yet. But within this master plan, what individual pieces fit into the Corona Relief Fund and which of those pieces are kind of our bailiwick having to do with housing? And I think it's very hard for us to deal with any of this unless we unless we see something like that, and then help you know can help refine it. So that's my request. I, I, I just don't know if it's possible. Well, Representative Walls, I'd be happy, as I said, to sit down with my colleagues at the State Housing Authority and at the Vermont Housing Finance Agency and begin to sketch out something along the lines of a master plan. I guess I am also saying to you as urgently as I can um, that if we wanna take a bite into this now, um, because we have $1.25 billion available to the state to address an issue that I think causes lots of other disruption and financial impact, um, mm -hmm. that this is a good time to do that um, and to push as hard as we can to to get some of these folks into permanent housing. And, and as I look at numbers, you know, we, I think I recall that the um, roadmap to end homelessness suggested we needed 368 units of permanent supportive housing. Um, I think, you know, that number, we have better data today because of the coordinated entry system and because we now have data on all the folks who've shown up needing GA support in this crisis uh, to formulate that larger plan. But I, I think if you wait for the master plan to do anything, we will miss an opportunity that is in front of us now. Yeah, thank you for saying that, Gus, and that's not what I was suggesting. Absolutely, we need yeah. to move this to the front burner and even before the burner, we need to act on uh, whatever we can do right now to take care of these people who, who are being temporarily housed. Yeah, no question about that. But to to get farther into this, I need to. I really want to understand yes. the whole thing better. Boy, it is vague. <laughs> it, it, well, it is vague, and you know, traditionally, housing resources from the federal government come in lots of different silos. Mm. Some monies come from HUD. Some monies come from USDA Rural Development. As I said a few minutes ago, there may be opportunities from serve, for service dollars from FEMA. Um, there are, there's funding through tax credit programs. So they come at, it's complicated even for those of us who live in it every day. Yeah. How do we put the jigsaw puzzle together? Um, it's not like the old days back in the seventies of the section eight new construction substantial rehab program where you went one place and they gave you low interest debt. They gave you rental assistance. Um, you know, it all came at once that those days are long gone. So it is complicated. And again, we'd be happy, I think, to begin to sketch out the master plan and how do we weave all the resources together? And where are the gaps? 
Thank you very much, Gus. Representative Triano, then Hengo. So um, if we do in fact have $2 billion out there somehow, I think that um, maybe this committee should be working with appropriations or making recommendations to appropriations to, I mean, we've heard um, a number of different uh, plans and, uh, and, um, uh, and, and that would house hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, I think it is um, to the best interest of Vermonters to um, provide um, long-term housing or permanent housing to uh, as many of these folks as we can. So, you know, it's, my thoughts are to get to work with appropriations and uh, get the most um, we can to place as many people as we can in permanent housing. Um, and maybe that's something that we need to do. I, 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 like Tommy, it's very difficult to see a bill materializing that would um, uh, accommodate um, all of what we've heard um, on this housing issue at this point. So, you know, maybe it's just to get to a probes and, and make sure as much, uh, as many resources as uh, are available um, are uh, presented to, uh, to re rectify this problem. Representative Henko. Thank you. I'm still kind of um, trying to wrap my head around the dollars of this and Representative Waltz brought up um, kind of a, a way of looking at it that we need to look at the big picture, right? So my big picture is telling me that, um, you know, we have 200 units available right now that we could put people in um, just for simplicity's sake. I'm calling that 200 individuals, not 200 units. And it would cost about $10 million a year ongoing for those 200 units to be supported with services. So we have 2000 people who need to be rehomed, rehoused. And um, if I work that out in my brain, that's like 10 times 10 million, which is $100 million just in services. Um, that doesn't include capital for building new buildings or rehabbing old units. So I, um, I totally agree that we need to see some kind of big picture of where, what money is available to us for housing because obviously other hands are out asking for money for, for their projects. What money is available to us for housing and how we can use it, when we need to use it by, and going forward, this is the more important thing, how we would sustain it going forward. I totally agree with Representative Troiano that it's, um, it behooves us to rehouse as many people as we can, but my concern is that people are gonna get left out from this because there, it just isn't gonna be the money to go around. So rather than um, have a grand plan for say a thousand of the 2000 people having a more modest plan for the 2000 people who will need rehousing. And I don't know how to go about that until like representative Walsh said, I see the big picture because I really am a big picture person. So that's more of a comment than an actual question for anybody. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. That's, I mean, that's part of breaking it all down. Uh, Gus. Just one clarification, and I think you're asking exactly the right question, and I think it's absolutely fair to say what are the ongoing costs to the state of Vermont, and what will be the offset savings, whether in healthcare, corrections, mental health. The one clarification I just want to make is that that $10 million for services to capitalize a fund for services and rental assistance would handle five years. So the, that doesn't make your math question illegitimate. It just makes it one fifth of where you thought it might have been. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Uh, so it's about 10 million for every five years going forward, not counting inflation or, or added needs. 
Uh, that's correct. Thank you. All right, um, Gus, thank you so much. This is, we will um, be in touch and we will keep pushing. Uh, and I think that there's a clear desire on the part of um, the committee, at least as expressed this morning, that it would be appropriate for you to work uh, and start shaping a master plan with the people who know how to do it. Um, I would like to be able to reach out to the Senate. I know you're testifying to the Senate. I know you're probably gonna be in contact or at least with Senate uh, appropriations as I mean, as, and, and ours. Um, I know it's gonna be a couple busy weeks uh, on the appropriations front as, as appropriations develops a skinny budget. So there's gonna be a lot of, a, a lot of work on this. Um, I'm gonna reach out again to Senator Sorotkin to see if we can actually, if, if it's worthwhile to at least Again, I know you're testifying in front of them, I think this week as well, um, but it would be good to hear what the Senate is thinking as well. I know that housing is a priority of, of um, the Senate Economic and Development Committee, a General Affairs Committee as well. So um, I think that the next steps, will we will be in touch and we'll try to see what we get for our Friday session on committee. Um, and committee, it's just being conscious of the time. I just wanted to remind you if you did if you did not get a, um, I'm sure you, you may have gotten a, an email from Luke Martland today uh, concerning doing a survey on the uh, Legislative Council, folks that have helped our committee. Um, he says it takes 10 minutes. It took me 15, basically because we needed to answer questions on all the different attorneys. I think we had questions on David Hall. Um, as well as Damien and um, and others, including Luke. So just take make sure you take the time as, as quickly as you can to do the to do that. Um, it's important for them to get an idea of how you felt about the work that was done and provided by legislative council. Um, and uh, chair, you know, Katie was left out of that, and I didn't I didn't write to Luke about that. Should I? You can write him a note. Um, okay. You can write him a note. I think it. You know, it it speaks to the broad portfolio that we had like four attorneys and we missed one, you know, because I don't think Tucker was in there as well oh, either. Right. And so um, as opposed to maybe some committees only have one or two attorneys that they work with, like government operations. So um, anyway, just take the time. And if you do have private notes, there's pl plenty of room in the survey to let those go. Um, I guess on a lighter note, um, uh, one of the little, I call them bumper stickers, you know, whatever little things that you see on social media over the weekend. Um, somebody wrote a, somebody wrote a little bumper sticker and said, I guess no one wins the contest of, I knew that from five years ago that said, I know what I'm going to be doing five years from now. Um, I think we all would have failed that. And, uh, and uh, so I thank you for your continued um, work on this and efforts to try to have some form of regularity. It's good to see you all after um, a weekend, which was spent out in the garden finally. And uh, we will see you this afternoon. Okay. Uh, on, this, on tap from our committee this week will be the, um, no pun intended, will be the alcohol bill. Um, Representative Byron, I, I believe is scheduled to do some conversation about it today and um, it'll be on the floor on Friday. So thank you everybody. Um, Ron, I'll stay on the line with you for a minute. And